Hello and welcome to Africa Here and Now. We've had a slight makeover, but this is still the podcast that takes a fresh look at events on the continent and at how Africa relates to the rest of the world. I'm Martine Dennis with our first episode of 2024. Today, we take a hard look at the Horn. In Sudan, the genocide that's taking place in Darfur 20 years after the last one and no one's blinking an eye. Why is Ethiopian Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed prepared to antagonise almost everyone with his bid to recognise the breakaway region of Somaliland in exchange for a port? We look at the mass killings in Nigeria's Plateau State and at DRC's hugely expensive election plus. Why are England's football managers down in the dumps this month? Could it have something to do with the more than 30 African players who are leaving their Premier League clubs to play for their countries? Former Nigerian international Efan Okoku talks us through the 34th Africa Cup of Nations as it kicks off in Côte d'Ivoire. And finally, what are your hopes for the new year? We hear from a young tech bro in South Africa. Well, to help me unpack all these is Donu Kogbera, the journalist. She's in the Nigerian capital, Abuja. And Patrick Smith, editor of Africa Confidential, who is here in London. Happy New Year to you both. How have you been? Have you made any New Year's resolutions, Donu and Patrick? Both of you are on mute. (laughs) My resolution is to become... Techno competent, or <laughs> in, in some way or another, yeah. I never make New Year's <laughs> resolutions. Uh, that's perennial New Year's resolution on my part. <laughs> Not to make them. And Donu, what about you? Yeah, well, I'm the complete opposite of Patrick. Um, <laughs> January the first brings out a frenzy of self improvement, aspirational, general things in me. So. At the moment, I'm trying to become sharper mentally and healthier physically. Gosh, good luck with that. Well, I've been making the same resolutions for about the last 40 years um, (laughs) and and getting nowhere. We better crack on because we've got so much to get through. Now, just say the words genocide and Darfur and you go back 20 years when the world, including celebrities like George Clooney, mobilised against the horror that was taking place in Western Sudan. But it's happening again right now. And this time, it seems, nobody cares. For nine months, Sudan's army has been fighting the Rapid Support Forces, a paramilitary outfit that has its roots in the Janjaweed militias who raped, pillaged and plundered Darfur two decades ago. It boggles the mind that this can be happening again. To find out more, Donu, Patrick and I caught up with Alex Daval, who's executive director of the World Peace Foundation and a foremost expert on the Horn of Africa. And he got us up to speed on the recent movements of General Dugalo, who's also known as Hemeti, the leader of the Rapid Support Forces. What we're seeing in the last few weeks is that uh, General Mohammed Hamdan Dugalo, known as Hemeti, has emerged from Sudan. He, he'd not been seen really since the outbreak of the war. He's being flown around Africa and and probably also to Abu Dhabi in an Emirati jet. He's being received as though he were the uh, head of state in waiting, given every due protocol, much to the anger of his antagonist, General Al-Burhan. He seems to have uh, be on the point of, as it were, getting away with it. His strategy is because he knows that his reputation is so toxic that he cannot himself lead Sudan, but he wants to have a veneer of a civilian government to cover for his, the fact that he will be the real power broker in whatever political settlement emerges. And he has, um, he's winning the war, he has the money, he has the apparently unlimited backing of, 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 of Abu Dhabi. He has the support of, strong support of, 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 of the Ethiopians. Uh, Chad is covering his back, and it at the moment looks like he is going to emerge as, alongside Abiy, one of the the, the twin clients of the Emirates dominating Northeast Africa. Again, we we come back to to Abu Dhabi, don't we? Mohammed bin Zayed and his um, interference, if you like, in the continent. 
UAE is also a very close ally of the United States. What's Washington saying? They seem to have been very, very quiet until quite recently, when I think the State Department has come out and condemned both sides uh, for having committed war crimes and crimes against humanity. So the, the background to this is the Trump administration basically put its policy for the whole of the Red Sea arena in the hands of its favoured allies in the Middle East, that's Egypt, Israel, Saudi Arabia, and the UAE. And the UAE took this as a license to really aggressively expand its, its influence, actually much to the annoyance of the others. But Washington has given it essentially a free hand. It's been allowed to get away with pretty much anything in the region because Washington has many, many other agenda items with, with Abu Dhabi and you know, Iran now, um, Israel and the Abraham Accords, you know, the, the, the list goes on. And when the, the war in Sudan broke out, the internal policy within the administration had put the Sudan file exclusively within the Africa Bureau of the State Department. And now no diplomat from the Africa Bureau is really going to get the time of day in any of those Middle Eastern capitals, especially Abu Dhabi. So in a way, it was, it, it was an exercise in surrendering the agenda and, and saying, we will just try and tick the boxes while the real business is done elsewhere. And it's only um, in the last month or so that administration officials and, and members of Congress have begun to call out um, the UAE. Now, the, the difficulty that, that the US um, and other potential mediators face yeah. is that um, if you want to get an agreement in Sudan, you need to get both sides to sit down together. And um, that is General uh, Hameti and the Rapid Support Forces and, and General Burhan and, and, and the Sudan Army. And Burhan does not preside over a united house. He has a, a coalition of forces, which include veteran Islamists from the former regime of Omar al-Bashir. And they are exercising a de facto veto. Every step that um, al-Burhan takes to begin to make a compromise towards humanitarian access or ceasefire, any sort of talks, they come out and they veto it. And this, of course, is, is, is a gift for Hermeti. He has the political field to himself. What about sanctions, Alex? So Hermeti's business empire has got a lot of cash stashed away in uh, Dubai, for example. Burhan's getting support from Turkey, it seems, and... Um, to perhaps a lesser extent from Malaysia, is there any attempt to put real pressure on, on, on that money, whether it's the UAE money, or Turkey or Malaysia? The, the pressure on the Islamist money, um, for obvious reasons, so because the, the Islamists in, in, in Sudan have been associated with Hamas and so on, and, um, the pressure on that money is, is serious. Right. The the difficulty of putting pressure on Hameti is that it's gold, and you know gold is the hardest of hard currency. Um, and ev ev even if you were to try and limit uh, the, the 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 flights of gold from um, from the gold mines in Darfur to to Dubai, um, there would be other ways of that gold finding its way to market. So sanctions are unlikely to be effective. The, the, the measure that would, that would be effective um, is uh, putting a reputational cost on Abu Dhabi, um, um, which cares about its reputation. It spends a lot of time and energy and money lobbying for good standing um, in, in Washington. And I'm sure that, 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 that uh, uh, Mohammed bin Zayed would be quite sensitive to, to direct appeals from President Biden. Uh, but while the file remains at a relatively junior level in, in the administration in Washington, um, the, the UAE can just snub it and its nose at what, anything that the US or the, Ameri or, or the Europeans do. Why does nobody really care? I mean, of course, that's an exaggeration, but um, there's very little real interest is it battle fatigue because we've got the Ukraine and we've got Israel? However, Sudan did predate these situations. I wish I could answer that question. It's baffling to me. I mean, 20 years ago, 
the Darfur file was, you know, at the UN Security Council. It was on the desk of of, of President Bush. There were crowds outside uh, new, the UN headquarters in New York, New York, on the Washington Mall, calling for an, an an end to the atrocities, calling for peace in Sudan. There were massive domestic constituencies mobilized on, on the Sudan issue. And that all has vanished. And it was George Clooney, I think. Wasn't he involved particularly? Exactly. George Clooney was involved. A host of other celebrities were, were involved, not only in the United States, also in, or also in Europe. And they all seem to have forgotten about it. And I wish I had an explanation. Where do you think things are going in the next month or so? Because there was... This hopeful moment, I think you wrote about it yourself in Foreign Policy, after this Djibouti meeting, uh, when it, it appeared to be agreed that Bouhan and Hemeti were going to sit down, face-to-face talks, and as you say, the Islamists intervened and then Bouhan backed down and wasn't going to do it. Now those face-to-face talks are, are meant to be on again. Uh, do you think that IGAD uh, initiative, bringing the two leaders together, and after Hemeti's... Uh, Round Africa Roadshow uh, has finished. There'll be any chance of a of a serious meeting between the two sides and and a ceasefire. It's touch and go. It could well happen, and there is some there is some quite serious, um, though not very visible, uh, diplomatic energy going into making uh, making that happen. And uh, Saudi Arabia, for example, is actually quite worried about the destabilization caused by its it, it, its neighbor, the, the Emirates, and, 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 and would really like to step up and, 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 and get behind a, a, an African initiative. Um, it's not interested in the glory, it's more interested in the outcome. That's been one of the main uh, features of this conflict or this stage of the conflict, and that's the, the number of outside players that are involved, the number of dialogue initiatives that have been started and then, by and large, have have amounted to nothing. Um, There seem to be a plethora of people having a go, but nobody really uh, getting anything of any consequence together. I think that's absolutely correct. And and, and the vacuum here is is one that the, the African Union could step into if it had the requisite leadership. Because um, this is a this is a war in which all the out, every outside power has its favourite, but it's a war that every outside power also recognises. If it continues, will mean that Sudan is a failed state, is is nothing more than ruins, which is not in anybody's interest. And in the past, when Sudan has got to this kind of state, such as. Um, 11 years ago when Sudan and South Sudan almost went to war, or they did very briefly have a war over the disputed area of Hejlij on their common border. It was the African Union Peace and Security Council that stepped up and created a consensus not only in Africa, but also that included China, Russia and the United States and, and, and Europe, that this had to be contained at a time when the UN Security Council was was entirely paralyzed over Syria. So there's, there are precedents, examples of the AU providing leadership and at least stabilizing this kind of, of, of crisis um, and, and, and getting a consensus because, because the US or China or the Europeans wouldn't be able to do that and only the Africans can, can do it. So I, I, I think there is a, an, an opportunity, but only if the political leadership from the African continent is ready to take it. I know a lot of Nigerians who hear this will ask me this question, so let me ask you, since I don't know the answer anyway. Um, what's, why is the UAE so interested? I mean, they've got everything going for them, thriving economy, massive infrastructural victories over a very short period of time everyone descending on them to buy gold and go on holiday or whatever. Why do they want to get involved in all these murky, messy, expensive ventures on another continent? It's a bit of a mystery why. What are the UAE's grand ambitions? Um, um, what are what are its motives? And a lot of it appears to come down to the individual of Mohammed bin Zayed. Um, 
who and and clearly there are elements to this in terms of controlling the um, the eastern approaches to the Red Sea, controlling those ports for both security and and, and commercial reasons, diversifying the UAE's investments, anticipating a post carbon future where it doesn't get money from oil and its food security is 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 uncertain so it may want uh, agricultural land in in africa it may be that it 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 sees itself as really just a small vulnerable country surrounded by um, much bigger neighbors and, and 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 it wants to have a position itself as a sort of the strategic intermediary at the crossroads of the world with um, able able to deal in a privileged way with Russia, China, the United States, and, uh, as well as its neighbours. Um, it's not entirely clear. So 2024 does not look to be terribly bright or prosperous, particularly if you're mass elite in Darfur. Sadly, the uh, to get back to the your point, the plight of ordinary people in Sudan, and especially in the areas of Sudan, like Darmasalit in the western part of Darfur, which has been utterly ravaged and blood-soaked in the pursuit of local vendettas, local agendas by the uh, members of the Rapid Support Force and and their local militia allies. Um, Amid this swirl this turmoil this snake pit of regional international global politics the interests the rights of such people are being sadly overlooked as we'd cornered alex we thought we'd take the liberty of running another important story by him the one where prime minister abiy ahmed of landlocked ethiopia secures access to the sea in exchange for giving official recognition to Somaliland, a breakaway region of Somalia. The move has been almost universally condemned. It broke on January the 1st and took most of us by surprise. Well, in one respect, it's not a surprise in that uh, Prime Minister Abiy, in his five and a half years in power, uh, seems to have made it routine to upend and subvert every tradition of Ethiopian foreign policy and diplomacy and to trounce on the norms and processes of the African Union and multilateralism more generally. However, this one is is a particular surprise because uh, Ethiopia has been the number one champion over some uh, 60 years of the principle of the inviolability of the colonial boundaries inherited by African states at independence. And Ethiopia has been particularly vigilant in respecting this with regard to Somalia because of Somali claims on Ethiopian territory. And over the last 30 years, um, Ethiopia has always balanced its dealings with the breakaway Republic of Somaliland with making sure that um, other neighbors, particularly Somalia, but also Djibouti, are on board with whatever steps it takes. It takes towards Somalia. So what do you think has changed then recently? Prime Minister Abiy has been quite um, vociferous in his desire to get access to another sea port, and that has unsettled the region, hasn't it, in the last months? He's been quite vocal about it. Absolutely, and and, and that has been reconfiguring, reshuffling alliances um, across the Horn so that um, we have, as it were, a, a... an alliance of surrounding states that are very worried by this, Eritrea, Djibouti, Somalia, and the Sudan army uh, of General Burhan in Sudan are all deeply uh, disturbed by this. But it's also part of a a broader pattern in that um, the main sponsor and patron of the uh, Ethiopian government and Abiy's personal uh, ambitions and adventurism is the United Arab Emirates which has a um, now rather well-established practice of adventurism uh, in across the Red Sea arena, backing uh, the breakaway secessionist movements, disregarding um, uh, multilateral norms and traditions, and massively sponsoring um, not only uh, 
Abbey and his plans, but also some other leaders um, and aspiring leaders in the region, such as General Hemeti in Sudan. Somalia's called for the African Union to hold an emergency meeting on this. What do you think is likely to happen then, Alex, when presumably the Peace and Security Council would have to have a look at it? Well, the African Union um, as an institution, especially the Commission, but also the Peace and Security Council, has become very eviscerated in the last few years, um, largely because it is um, present, it, it is hosted by Ethiopia, it is there in Addis Ababa. And Ethiopia has made sure that it, it did absolutely nothing um, in direct contravention of its own uh, its own constitutive act in response to the the wars, especially the war in Tigray, um, over the last few years. And the the, the, the uh, chairperson of the commission, uh, Musa Faki, has been singularly ineffective. However, this is is, is such an obvious violation of the. Um, AU standing procedures that it will be very difficult for it not to respond. And what we see also is that IGAD, the Intergovernmental Authority on Development, the Northeast African bloc, um, whose uh, executive secretary is, uh, was appointed by Abiy, is equivocating on this. It doesn't want to take a stand one one way or the other. So I I suspect we're going to see uh, confusion rather than resolution. Well, um, apparently in 2018, there was some kind of agreement around the port of Berbera, a sort of prior attempt to gain access to the sea on the part of uh, the Ethiopian government, and it all fell through. It was it was linked to the UAE, this, I don't know whether you'd call it adventurism or commercialism, but they had a stake in the, in the enterprise. And... Ethiopia could not meet up with its financial obligations. I think it was an 18% stake or something. So how is this going to be different? Well, the, the situation today is, is really quite different. Um, five, six years ago, the Ethiopian strategy, which was the well-established strategy, was to, was to diversify its access to the sea so that it was not reliant on Djibouti, its main port, as almost its sole source of imports and exports. So it, it, it was um, investing heavily in what was called the Berbera Corridor, and then another corridor through Kenya to the port of Lamu, as well as, as Port Sudan through Sudan. And this was a standard intergovernmental set of agreements, um, uh, cooperative agreements, which were signed with neighboring states. In this case, although there was some uh, a little disquiet in in Somalia about the agreement with Somaliland over, over Mogadishu, they went along with it. They understood the rationale, and it was not actually leasing, ceding territory. Um, and, the, and the UAE's um, investment was uh, commercial rather than um, strategic. So this is a, a, a very different kettle of fish and much more. And, and whereas the previous engagement of Ethiopia with its neighbors was one of of stabilizing the region in order to gain multiple um, viable routes to the sea. The current strategy is destabilizing the region in order to seize a particular piece of territory in order to have a, a direct control and a naval base, which is very different. Given that it is in, in the doldrums, the, the economy back home, his uh, popularity is tanking, is this perhaps a tactic to deflect away from problems at home, as is commonly the case when, you're, when you've got a, a bad rap at home, you tend to go abroad. I think both for, for Abiy and for the Somaliland president, Musa Bihi, this is partly a tactic to, to distract from problems at home. I mean, Musa Bihi is long overdue to face re-election. He's facing serious problems at home. He, he blundered into a military conflict with neighboring Puntland last year, which he lost. Um, so both both leaders want to be able to to have something to wave in front of their people as, as a, a flag of success. And is there anybody or anything that can stop this going ahead? I mean, the EU has, has said quite clearly that they are against it. Uh, Mogadishu seems to have 
got the support of the Arab League, the Organization of Islamic Conference, and Egypt, rather importantly, Egypt, who perhaps is the most upset about the potential of having an Ethiopian military base just down the coast from its own. There's really nobody in favour of this, apart from the UAE, which has thus far remained silent. And whether the UAE minds about isolation um, remains to be seen. But there are actually many, many uh, logistical and financial and other obstacles in the way of actually uh, achieving this. It would take quite some um, financial and possibly military investment for it to um, to come in, in into being and and building a port, building a naval base, acquiring a navy is a very long term uh, project. Donu, you've also got an important story that you've been following. I mean, it seems as though mass killings are happening in Nigeria now on a weekly basis. That's right. I mean, Nigeria is, you know, a killing fields country. Over Christmas, gunmen attacked 25 communities in three local governments of Plateau State, and 200 people are dead. Properties worth billions of naira have been destroyed. The people who run the show in the Middle Belt, i.e. the governors, seem as perplexed as everyone else as to why this is happening. They have actually, the chairman of the, the forum, of the Middle Belt Governors Forum, has actually said that they do not know, they need to get to the bottom of this. Why is it happening? And so, you know, as with so much in Nigeria, an investigation needs to be undertaken. And um, of course, there's, there's killings all over the country for different reasons. But last week's uh, plateau killing was particularly poignant because of the, the timing of it. Now, one thing that one of the governors said was that dilapidated roads, as he put it, like the one between Abuja and Jos, need to be renovated or refurbished because they have become safe havens for terrorists. At this stage, it almost doesn't matter what the motivation of the killers are. Fact is, Plateau State is in crisis. Well, that's uh, that's really bad news. And that's something that I think that we should actually look a little bit more closely at in in future editions, Donu. Patrick, over to you. You've been interested, haven't you, by this uh, $1 billion plus, I think, uh, spent by Kinshasa on a very, very flawed election. So the question is, is it better to have a bad election or no election? Yeah, I mean, it, it's less an election than a, a division of political patronage, essentially. So you've got uh, 44 million registered voters. Congolese population is over 100 million. And of those 44 million registered voters, only 43% of them turned up uh, or was a- were able to vote in the elections uh, on the 20th of December. Uh, And at the end of that, um, the results were declared and uh, the incumbent president, Felix Chishikedi, to no huge surprise has to be said, uh, walked away with 73% of the the votes cast and all the opposition candidates, bar a couple of uh, rather more pliant politicians, uh, opposed opposed the official results and declared uh, a mass fraud, and that's uh, so it, the biggest uh, opposition uh, candidate, Moise Katumbi, got eighteen uh, percent. Martin Fayulu, who won the election, uh, according to uh, most uh, most observers in 2018, got a mere 5%. And the most famous candidate, Dennis Mukwege, who's the Nobel Prize winning doctor and surgeon, got less than 1% of the vote. So there's, there's you know, a, a big uh, outrage in, in Congo about this. Um, but the, the feeling is, sadly, that not much is going to follow from these opposition protests, partly because the, co- the Congo economy is so vital to the new green green economic transition. Congo's got 70% of the world's cobalt, plenty of lithium, copper, uh, nickel, and gold. 
uh, and various other uh, minerals that are needed for this economic transition. So uh, the big economies, whether it's in China or the US or the European Union, are saying, well, it's, it's, it's up to the Congolese. So there's, there's, a, there's a lot of soul searching going on amongst political activists in Congo. But the, the, the thought is that the, the rest of the world is going to say, well, you've had your election, got the result, and we're just going to carry on uh, working with you guys, with your, with your cobalt reserves. You've got the second biggest rainforest in the world, big carbon sink for the world. And that's what's important about Congo and sort the election out yourselves. <laughs> OK, all right. Thanks for that, Patrick. Now, let's turn to AFCON football. This is Donu's favourite part of today's show. Africa Cup of Nations, it gets underway on January the 13th. Uh, there's a, a group stage first and that's followed by a knockout stage. I don't know why I'm telling you all this. I don't fully understand it myself. And judging by... Uh, Donu's expression, she's not even really interested. <laughs> However, we have <laughs> we have Efana Koko, a former super eagle, to take us through um, the Africa Cup of Nations, the 34th, taking place in Cote d'Ivoire and starting in a couple of days from now. Efan, thank you for taking some time out of your very busy schedule. Um, I would like to ask you what you think Jurgen Klopp, the Liverpool manager, what do you think his worst nightmare might be right now? Oh, uh, good afternoon, everybody, wherever you are in the world. Um, what would be his worst nightmare? Mo Salah getting injured, of course. <laughs> That's what I was thinking. <laughs> yeah, in any shape or form over the course of the next three weeks, three and a half, four weeks, potentially. I mean, the final is on the is on the 11th of February. Um, so if Egypt do as well as they did last time out, and then, of course, they could reach the final. Um, so that's another, about another four or five domestic matches he could miss. You know, ideally, he would like Egypt to play well, but go home early or leave early and be and have, <laughs> and, and have his star player back on Merseyside in, in, um, in the northwest of England within about two weeks' time. I mean, I mean that's a possibility. But Egypt have a really good record. Don't they have a really good record at winning this competition? They do. Seven times champions. You know, they are the leading light um, in the history of, of, of AFCON. But it's not, it's not the squad or team of players that we saw in the uh, late 90s, early to mid noughties. You know, a fantastic squad. They now have the most famous African player that they've, you know, that they've ever had. Uh, but he's one, one leading light amongst a group of ordinary, you know, to good players. And that's not likely, you know, to cut the mustard at AFCON, I would imagine. My uh, my feeling is that, you know, the the runners-up spot that they got last time that they, when they lost to, to Senegal is is the best that this group of players, you know, can, can muster. And as a Liverpool fan, I'd be quite happy, you know, to see him back early. <laughs> so who are you putting your money on? I reckon most eyes will be on the Moroccan team, right? Given that they did so well at the World Cup in Qatar. Yes, they did. But, um, you know, AFCON is a, is a completely different ball game. Morocco coming to the tournament as, as favourites. Uh, most casual observers would, would, say, would say heavy favourites. But, you know, that's discounting Morocco's, you know, relatively poor record at AFCON over the course of, of its history since 1957. Um, only four teams, you know, on, in that initial edition. So one, one solo win a long time ago. And it's very difficult, actually, for North African sides to win south of the Sahara. And I don't think Morocco particularly like playing, you know, the favour tag or being tagged as favourites. Um, generally, you know, North African teams do well as a counter-attacking sort of mentality or having that. And, and that, I think, you know, serves them well on occasion. Certainly served Morocco well in the World Cup, where they were underdogs in most of the matches they played. But you know, playing against uh, teams of equal stature or close to is it's going to be very difficult um, with the way they that, that they like to play the game. I don't think the climate is going to be particularly harmful, you know, to them. You know, these guys have played up and down the, the, the continent, you know, for many, many years. Um, I'm particularly interested in the, I think it's about 30, isn't it, Premier League uh, players who yeah. are now absenting themselves from their clubs and then, uh, putting on their national jerseys in order to play in AFCON. Um, what sort of conflict does that present to uh, an African player as to whether 
he stays with his club where, where he's obviously got a promising career or whether he actually goes and plays for his country and be and is more patriotic? I think there's less friction when uh, perhaps you are the sole player leaving your club. If anybody has a handful of players, not enough players, I think I have three or four players at AFCON, you know, so that's a, that's a couple of players who are very important, you know, to the squad dynamic. So if you have a head coach who has to lose his players, and of course, you know, you factor that in when, when you buy these guys anyway, most of them are established internationals when they come to the Premier League, but it can have a damaging effect. It also can affect you personally. You come back, you have to fight your way back into the team. That's not always easy. Some um, managers can hold it against you. You know, that was my experience, you know, when I left to play Upcom back in 1994. So it depends on your relationship with the head coach, of course. But it's, it's a cause of concern. But, you know, the overriding fact is that most of the boys want to come and play for their nation. And uh, FIFA has, has pulled rank in recent years and said, you know, you, you cannot hold a player back. If he decides he wants to retire, that's fine. Uh, but a few players have, have pulled out of tournaments over the course of the last, you know, 25 years or so plus. Uh, but in the main, the players are happy, you know, to come and, and pull on the national jersey. Donu, what do you think? You played for Nigeria in, was it 1994? That's right, yeah, in uh, Tunisia that was, yeah. Okay, well, you don't really look old enough, but um, that's 30 years ago. It is a long time, yeah. Yeah. I have a few grey whiskers these days. (laughs) Well, um, have you, do you find that um, things, the African clubs or the African national teams have become better organised in the time in the past three decades, or are they still messing around? Because, I mean, believe it or not, I've actually been to a couple of football matches here in Abuja mm. and um, with, a, with friends who were terribly keen, and my son was living with me at the time, and they were just horrified that the poor lad had never been to a football match. So they dragged us along, you know. And there was all kinds of dramas, like the players refusing to come on until the money they'd been promised had been paid. And did you find any of that? Oh, yes, many times. Do you know what I mean? Honestly, there was one time we had to wait for an hour <laughs> while the players said, we're not doing it. <laughs> As they say in Nigeria, money for hand, back for ground. Yes. <laughs> that's <a million laughs> phrase. Uh, yeah, that's the shame. You know, these things are happening on a, a daily, weekly basis in many parts of Africa. And... Uh, I've always said, you know, certainly with my experience with Nigeria for quite a few years in the 90s, the team was successful in spite of the organisation, in spite of the federation, because we have so many good players. And that's the case for quite a few nations. There are many other nations, I'm sure, that are much better, much um, much more organised in uh, Nigeria in terms of infrastructure, in terms of um, administration, etc., who don't have the pool of players. And sometimes, you know, the less you have, the more you manage it efficiently and you become a better unit. That's been the case with some of the smaller nations across the continent over the last 15 to 20 years. Um, you look at Morocco now, Morocco, Morocco don't have the natural talents of many of the other nations on the continent. What they have um, under King Mohammed in the last 10 or 15 years is a fantastic will, you know, to improve, spend lots of money on infrastructure, the best infrastructure on the whole continent for the men's team, lots of investment in the women's game as well. Um, people have been saying for 10 or 12 years that if Morocco get all, all, the, all these things right, it will help the players who are good, who are ordinary, you know, to good players in the main, one or two outstanding players, to reach a level which, which they may become, you know, the number one in Africa. That was realised in Qatar just over one year ago, you know, the best performance that we've ever seen from an African nation. Now, if the rest of the continent were to get 50% of what Morocco has, Nigeria, you know, Africa could have a one or two more places in the semi-finals of the World Cup, potentially even reaching the final of the World Cup. So these things were happening many, many years ago um, and continue to happen, unfortunately. And, and that's what is holding the continent back in terms of sporting achievement, not only in football, but throughout the, you know, the um, sporting... The sports arena, yeah. establishment. Um, if you were to offer one piece of advice, OK, to the Nigerian sports administration people, or maybe generally across the continent, what would your number one recommendation be for strengthening of the sport? There'll be many. If you do things with the good of the people in mind, and that would mean you need to eliminate your own self-interest, which is a problem, you know, throughout the continent. 
No, you mean they should stop taking bribes? That would help, yeah. I'm being polite. What I didn't else? want to use that word. <laughs> I didn't want to use the big C word, you know, corruption. But if, if you have a selfless nature in mind, uh, one or two important people within the Federation, everybody else will follow and, and do things that will benefit everybody. And then if you want to leave a legacy, so if you had two or three terms in office, people would say, well, okay, he was here and uh, we've now improved the national stadium in uh, Abuja, in a uh, stadium throughout the world. There's, there's now a platform by which young boys and girls can come and enjoy football in a safe environment and to, you know, give kids the opportunity to progress. Effen, why do you think um, there's so little corporate money going into the Cup of Nations? You know, the, the top prize is $7 million. Yeah. I mean, that that's almost uh, Mo Salah's takeaway pay for the month. Yeah. Uh, it, it seems amazing, given that Africa's got to be one of the most football-infused continents on the planet, certainly rivaling Latin America, South America these days, um, why is why are none of the companies putting any money into the sponsorship of this event? It seems a, a big omission. Absolutely. Um, yeah, seven million dollars is a small change, isn't it? Really, as you said, you know that's yeah, most salaries uh, salary for about one month or something. Um, the big problem here for me is, you know, that saying um, less is more. Afcon should be on a four-year cycle. If then you build up the anticipation, the excitement to, you know, three years of, of qualifying or two years of, of qualifying, for example, um, you attract more interest, you generate more, um, uh, more hits on social media these days. The investors, for example, who maybe have a two or three tournament cycle uh, as, a, as, as a primary sort of um, sponsor, for example, Coca-Cola, Visa, MasterCard or whatever, and then you have, you know, one or two of their rivals, uh, Budweiser, Heineken, etc., uh, Pepsi, who want to become involved. Now they'll become, le or they are less interested if every two years they have to keep on, you know, uh, forking out money. Uh, you know, it's it's much harder to travel throughout the continent as, Afri as Africa. We, we all know it's it's, it's a huge uh, landmass. So you you generate more excitement by the players being seen less often in the national jersey. If you do that, and of course, I think then automatically you get. You, you get more sponsorship or you'll get more interest from t t TV companies around the world, from North America, South America, certainly from Europe as well, uh, because they'll think, well, OK, this is something that is not a rival to the World Cup, but certainly could rival the Euros in terms of excitement, in terms of organisation. So once again, we go, well, I go back to the point about, you know, people doing things on it um, with a more selfless sort of of nature. And I understand why it was on a two year cycle when it was first, we were, when AFCON first arrived in 1957, because it was a way to generate more money for the federations when very few players, if perhaps none at all in the late 50s, were playing European football. Now the African players have the profile. They don't need to be pushed in that regard any, anywhere near as much. Uh, they earn a great amount of money in a lot of, of the big players, the big African players throughout the world. So. The profile should be around building the infrastructure and building the right sort of package to sell to broadcasters and less focus on the players. Um, as a result of that, you know, the players become much more marketable, much more marketable once every four years. And then it, it does, it, it's a strain on the players physically. It's a strain on the clubs that employ them, who pay their wages. Um, they will be less likely to complain about the player leaving for three weeks once every four years as opposed to every two years. It's something perhaps that, you know, one or two managers now look at African players as other case. We have a small budget. We don't have the riches of Manchester City or PSG, for example. So we can't afford to have two or three key players who are leaving once every two years. So we may refrain or decide that, you know, as, as good as that player is, we can't afford to lose two or three players like that, you know, um, once every uh, two years, for example. And uh, finally... Efan, can I ask you to put your neck on the line then and who are you putting your money on to win this year's AFCON? Well, I think the defending champions at Senegal have to be taken seriously uh, because they have the quality of play. And also they always seem a very settled nation in terms of how they go about their football. Um, and because historically as well, you know, they've not always had a great team, but I think, you know, they've built or they've had a programme there where they've sort of, they've got, a selfless way in which they go about their business. And that's always shown, I think, with the way that they've played over the last four to five seasons in particular. Um, they have a coach who's been there before, as 
as uh, the, the top man in charge. Um, you know, so they seem quite calm in that regard. Ivory Coast, of course, on home soil, very hard to beat, you know, inspired by their own local fans. Morocco, I think, you know, you know, could get to the semi-final. I think it depends on their, on their mentality. Um, and then outsiders, uh, Ghana, Nigeria, um, or perhaps Cameroon. It's, it's very difficult to call on, until you've seen everybody play, I think, at least twice. And then you can start to say, OK, this person's in form as a group of players. They look to be a good uh, collective outfit. So right now, it's, I'll put money on, on Senegal or Ivory Coast. Yeah, just not my own money. Evan <laughs> 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 uh, Koko, thank you very much indeed uh, for talking to us here at the Africa Here and Now podcast. Thanks a lot. Thank you. And finally, as we start a new year, what are your hopes or your worries for 2024? Luyanda Alexander, a 28-year-old South African, sent us this. Hi, Martine. Huge fan of the podcast and honoured to have this opportunity to contribute. If I was to share one thing that worries me in 2024, I would definitely say it's the upcoming elections. One third of Africa will be going to the polls this year, with some elections more democratic than others, I must say. But I really hope that as many people as possible will make their voices heard with their ballots, particularly the youth. Something I hear a lot among the youth are sentiments along the lines of, quote, I'm not interested in politics, close quote, despite the fact that politics touches nearly every aspect of life. So I hope we'll all be active, engaged citizens in 2024. I also hope we can move away from the blind, unquestioning loyalty that is shown to political figures and parties as if they're sports teams and be able to make more decisions based on an objective assessment of their track record, policies, etc. On the other hand, what excites me in 2024 is how we'll leverage the advent of AI and LLMs in Africa. Africa is the world's mobile banking leader with the highest number of services, account holders and transactions. In the same vein, I hope that we'll also be able to lead with AI services, particularly supporting inclusion in areas such as healthcare and education. One thing's for sure, there'll be lots going on in Africa this year, and I'm excited to follow all the developments on Africa here and now. Luyanda Alexander in Johannesburg with that. And LLMs, by the way, are language learning models like chat GPT, I'm reliably informed. You can tell he works in tech. And that ends this edition of Africa Here and Now. Remember to subscribe to us and write a review wherever you get your podcasts. It really helps. You can also email me, martine at africaheareandnow.com. I'm on Twitter or X at Martine Dennis. We're on Instagram too. We recorded this on Monday, the 8th of January. Our producer is Anne Busby. Our original music is by Emric Adam. Thanks to our guests, Alex, Efan and Luyanda. From Donu, Patrick and me, thank you for your company.